Uh, hi everybody, Dr. E here. Uh, making this video today, I had a request from a student, so uh, here's kind of the problem. So you have a metal bar, the metal bar here is illustrated, has a mass M, and it's gonna be touching this U-shaped kind of rail, and I'm just gonna let the bar drop. So initially it has zero velocity, and once I drop it, well, you can see a loop there. That loop is placed in a magnetic field. And as that metal bar drops, see the area of that loop is getting smaller. So there's gonna be a change in flux there. So anyway, we got a bunch of questions based on this problem. Uh, one is derive an expression for the induced current and the direction. Uh, find what the terminal speed is. Does that bar just accelerate and continue accelerating so it's speed constantly increasing? or does it reach some terminal velocity? Um, and question C, let's find an expression for the velocity as a function of time. At time zero, it's, it's not moving, but as it starts dropping, what happens to the velocity versus time? So again, with all my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Uh, consider subscribing to my channel. If you have any questions, just leave a comment, I'll get back to you. So this is how you solve this problem. So the problem again, I'm considering here, this guy here has a mass M and I'm gonna drop it. And it really doesn't matter the way I've set it up if it's just dropping this. I could have also set up a problem where I just have a closed loop and if I drop the entire loop, okay, and the mass then would represent the entire mass of the loop, but um, the problem would be solved in a similar way. So uh, first thing you notice is we have a loop that has a certain area, at least initially it's H uh, is that initial height and L is the width and it's placed in a magnetic field uh, that has a magnitude b. Okay, so the, initially there's a certain flux going through that loop, right? You can write a magnetic flux is simply equal to the magnetic field multiplied by the area of that loop. And in this case, at least initially, the magnetic flux is simply h times l. Now, the important thing is that when this bar falls, right, when it drops a certain distance down here, what happens is that that area is shrinking. And that means that the amount of flux that goes through this loop is also changing. Therefore, you should know that if the flux changes with respect to time, which it's going to, um, you're going to get an induced EMF, an induced voltage in that loop. I'm gonna drop the negative sign here for Faraday's law. Um, or worry about the direction of the induced current in just a moment using Lenz's law, okay? But if I'm just worried about the magnitude here of the induced current, um, it's related to the change in flux. So here's my expression for the flux. Well, so what we have to do is you have to differentiate that with respect to time, right? So there's a bunch of constant terms here. There's the feel that doesn't change, there's the height that is changing, and then there's the width of that loop, which is also constant. So what we're gonna do is we simply factor out what the constant terms are here. This is B times L, and this other term simply becomes dH over dt. Okay, if you have a look at dH over dt, again, this is how this height, or the position of the bar with respect to the bottom here changes with respect to time. This is actually the velocity of the bar, right? Or the speed of the bar in this case for this kind of one dimensional motion here. So let's rewrite this expression as B L multiplied by uh, the magnitude of the velocity here. So that is my induced EMF. Now the entire loop here is going to have some resistance. We're gonna say here, we're gonna have some resistance R and that's the resistance of the entire network here. So the first question is what is the induced current? Well, the magnitude of the induced current, uh, very straightforward, simply the induced EMF divided by the total resistance of that loop. So substitute my expression over here for the induced EMF. And what you end up getting is BLV uh, divided by the radius. All right, that's the magnitude of the current. How about now, what about the direction of that induced current? So for that, we're gonna use Lenz's law. So if you first think about what's happening here, so as this bar drops to this position, there is less flux, right? There are less field lines here going through this area. And what Lenz's law says that the direction of the induced current is to oppose that change in flux. So really I wanna generate a current that is gonna make it 
also that's going to generate a field that's also coming out of the page because I don't want that flux to change. Okay, and the way you generate and an be induced here coming out of the page to oppose that change in flux is by generating a current. Okay, so think about it. It's either clockwise or counterclockwise. Now you can use one of your uh, right hand rules in order to determine that. Um, and you should convince yourself that the current here should be going in the counterclockwise direction. Okay. Producing an induced current in this counterclockwise direction is going to induce a magnetic field, or sorry, produce a magnetic field that's coming out of the page. So for this guy here, let's just write this as counterclockwise. All right, so that's the first part of my problem. The next one now is to find an expression for the terminal velocity. So remember, the initial velocity here at time zero was simply equal to zero. However, what happens now when it starts to fall? Well, when it starts to fall, there is an induced current. And we know that if there's an induced current, there's going to be a magnetic force acting on this wire. I mean, there's a magnetic force acting on all of these wires, but this is the one that we're really interested in here. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at all the forces acting on this wire. So for part B, let's do a free body diagram on that wire. So it has a weight. Remember that wire had a mass m. So the weight is simply mg. And now if you have a current i going from uh, right to left, like shown over here, placed in a magnetic field that's coming out of the page, there is a magnetic force acting on that wire. Right? The magnetic force as a vector here, let me write it out as i l cross b. So you have to evaluate this. Uh, L is a vector that goes in the direction of this current. So again, you take your right hand, you put it along the <laughs> current direction, you curl your fingers toward the field, that'll give you the direction of the force. And what you should find is that the magnetic force acting on this wire is going up like this. Now initially, in the magnitude of this force, what we can find is from this expression here. So let's write down our magnitude of the force will be the current, I, It'll be that length and multiplied by the field. Uh, these two vectors here are perpendicular to each other, so we don't have to worry about the sine of the angle theta here. All right, the last thing I'm going to do is I'm simply going to eliminate the current because the current here is these, this value of the induced current. So again, look at you have, you're going to have an extra L. So you're going to have a you're also going to have a b squared term, an L squared term, again, R and V. That is the magnitude of our magnetic force. Actually, the important thing about this magnetic force expression is that it depends on V. But initially, the velocity was zero. But it's going to start to speed up, right? Gravity is acting on it. But initially, this force is, is basically very, very small. And it gets bigger. And it'll continue getting bigger until the forces are balanced. Once the forces are balanced, we're going to find that the magnetic force, the magnitude anyway, is going to be equal to the weight. All right, there's going to be some point in time where that's going to happen. So what we can do now is we can set that up. Let's replace our expression for the magnetic force. So we have B squared, uh, L squared divided by R. And again, we have our speed now. And this is what we're going to call our terminal velocity. It's not going to get any faster than that. The magnetic force is never going to be bigger than the weight. It certainly can be smaller, but it's not going to be bigger. All right, and that has to be equal to mg. So the last step you can do now is simply get an expression for that terminal velocity. It's going to be mg. Uh, you bring the r at the top. And then the last step here, just divide by this term over here, uh, b squared and l squared. All right, there's the expression for the terminal velocity of a bar or a conductor here that's falling uh, in this way. And again, you can look at the problem just by making a fixed rectangular loop fall in the field and you should get the same expression. All right, in this last part now, I, I know initially I started out with zero velocity. I'm eventually going to get to some terminal velocity, which is given by this expression here in the blue box. Now the next step of the problem, I want to do a little bit more calculus here and I want to actually find an expression for the velocity 
as a function of time. What happens between both of those points? So let's go ahead and do that now. Okay, so for this last part again, what we're gonna start off with is a free body diagram again. So we already had those forces. We have the weight acting down, that's a constant force. And then we have this magnetic force which was acting up, which we had called FB. And the magnitude of that force, um, I think I had it written as B squared, L squared V, and that was also divided by uh, the resistance. Okay, so again, this is a constant force. This here is a force that gets bigger as a function of time because the velocity is getting bigger as a function of time. So let's go ahead now and write down Newton's second law. And again, my terminal velocity, I may use this expression a little bit later, so I just want to remind you that this was the terminal velocity that we found. So Newton's second law says you add up all the forces. Well, you have mg acting down. I'll call that positive. And we have our magnetic force acting up. And that there must equal to the mass times the acceleration of that rod. Remember, and here's our rod here that has a mass m. Now we can take this one step further. Let's get rid of my expression for uh, this magnetic force. So we have b squared, l squared v, divided by r. And now instead of writing mass times acceleration, I'm going to write mass. And instead of writing acceleration, well, acceleration, the definition is really the rate of change of the velocity with respect to time, right? Okay, so uh, next thing. Now, at this point here, all we have here is a differential equation. Um, there are a lot of tricks to solve equations like this. I'll show you kind of an easy one. You see equations like this when you look at capacitors or if you look at um, projectiles with uh, some kind of drag force. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to get rid of the term here this is just a constant term that multiplies the uh, speed. So I'm gonna get rid of it. So I'm gonna get rid of it by multiplying through by, by the resistance and dividing through by B squared L squared. So that means I'm gonna be left with something like this. That's a pretty straightforward term. And now here you gotta be a little bit careful. It's gonna look different from the first term, but again, you simply multiply by the resistance and you divide through by b squared and l squared. And the reason I want to do this is it really simplifies this expression. Because if you have a look at this entire first term here, it's only a constant term, and it's exactly the terminal velocity. Now the second term over here is not exactly the same because look at, there's no little g in this second term. However, you could still write it in terms of the terminal velocity. So that's what I'm gonna do now. So this guy here is simply the terminal velocity minus the velocity uh, must be equal to, again, this looks like terminal velocity except there's no gravity. So it kind of looks like this. And then you still have dv over dt. All right, now this simplifies this differential equation quite a bit. Uh, in order to solve this now, what I'm gonna do um, just kind of rearrange this. Let me factor out a negative sign. This is me if I'm V minus VT. Okay, and the last part, well, let's put the DT on one side of the equation and put all the terms that involve the velocity on the other side of the equation. All right, so on this left-hand side, I'm gonna get minus G divided by VT. Okay, and DT. And all the terms of the velocity, I'm going to put them on the other side. So this is dv. This is v minus vt. Anyway, make sure you understand these steps. It's pretty straightforward, but it's the first time you do it. Let's write it out on paper. Make sure you understand all the steps. All right, now what we have to do is we're going to integrate this. Everything over on this side. So we simply have a constant terms multiplied by dt. And here we have a more complicated term, but that's okay. We could still integrate this from zero all the way to some time when uh, the bar has fallen. And during that time, the velocity is going to initially start at zero, and I'm going to go to some value. I'll call it V prime. Uh, the left-hand side of this expression is super easy. You can take out all the constant terms, and this is all you're left with. <laughs> uh, the right side over here, if you integrate this, you get the natural log of V minus VT. And that has to be evaluated between both of those limits. 
If you substitute those limits in there, you get natural log. I use some properties of natural logs if I take the difference between both the two terms. So this expression here looks like this. And when you substitute the zero, you get minus the natural log of, and there's a zero in here. But again, you can combine both of those natural log terms to make it look simply like this. Okay, great. Now we're just about done. All you want to do now is isolate, because really the goal of this whole exercise here is to determine what is the expression for V as a function of time. So what you can do now is you could take an exponential of the left-hand side and the right-hand side. I'm actually going to do this right-hand side first. If you take exponential of a, a natural log, that'll simply get rid of that, and you're going to be left with this. Vt. Negative Vt. And if you take the exponential of this term, what you get is just an exponentially decaying function. Okay, just about done. All I want to do now is isolate what my expression for V is. That's easy. You can first bring this term in the denominator on the other side. Put that over here. And then again, then you still have to <laughs> get rid of this one. So two more steps. So we have V prime, which is really our function of time. It's going to be equal to Vt and minus Vt exponential of this term. All right, now you can write it a little bit more compactly. We could factor out a Vt term. And what I'm going to do now is I'm also going to substitute, actually get rid of Vt and put in all of the variables here. So my final expression for the velocity as a function of time should look something like this. Uh, MGR, that's the Vt, divided by B squared L squared. Uh, open the bracket, I get 1 minus this exponential term. And the term in the exponential, again, has a negative sign. And just be a little bit careful. This is B squared L squared times t. It's not exactly, remember, because you still have the little g here, which makes it a little bit different, and mr. All right. This looks like a very, very complicated expression. However, keep in mind, everything in the front is just a number. That's a terminal velocity that we had previously. And everything multiplying time is also only a number. If you go ahead and actually just make a quick sketch of what this graph would look like, Right, what the physics looks like here, if I plot that velocity as a function of time uh, versus time, I know initially here I was at zero. And I know at some later time down here, I'm eventually going to re reach my terminal velocity. So I know after a long period of time, my velocity has to get over here. Uh, the way this function here works now is uh, this term over here eventually goes to zero the second term as time gets big because it's just an exponentially decaying term. So this whole function now will simply looks something like this. So you'll eventually reach that terminal velocity. All right, folks. Well, that's it for this problem. Thanks for watching. Again, if you have any questions, just shoot me a comment.